So we're going to call back Dr. Ashrath Guha to talk about um, pulmonary hypertension and RV failure. It's a broad topic, 12, 12 to 12 minutes. <laughs> Go ahead and uh, uh, talk about uh, pH and RV failure. Uh, most of my talk will be on pH and we will just uh, go uh, um, and review a few things about RV failure. Um, so pH, um, it's a hemodynamic, you know, definition of pulmonary hypertension. So mean artery, uh, pulmonary artery pressure over 25 and uh, mean PA pressure with a uh, wedge pressure under 15 is what defines pulmonary arterial hypertension in association with PVR greater than three woods units. So this was from the Fifth World Symposium. There have been talks in the Sixth uh, World Symposium to change this definition a little bit. So more to come. May maybe later in the year we will, uh, you know, hear some uh, update from the societies if they want to include either an exercise <coughs> component. Uh, to this and maybe decrease the mean PA pressure to 20. So that's at least something that's been proposed, but it's not yet um, out in the guidelines yet. So the main thing here that I want you all to take home is that you really need a right heart cath to make a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension and the same with, you know, pulmonary hypertension because the misclassification rates in echocardiogram can be as high as 25%. So patients who, uh, who, you know, have um, mean PA pressure or, or systolic PA pressure of 30 could still have a pulmonary hypertension. So when patients present to you with echocardiograms where the systolic PA pressure is over 40, that's, those are the patients in whom you have to, uh, you know, suspect pH. So the clinical classification of pH, again, who group one through five, Quickly, uh, you know, who group one is PAH, and uh, who group two is left heart disease, three is lung disease, four is chronic thrombo thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and five is one with unclear multifactorial mechanisms. So the one that is most of the um, therapies are approved for is PAH, but the most common uh, is the one due to left heart disease. Again, through for CTEF2, there is a, a drug which is approved right now. So in terms of, uh, you know, what happens when patients get pulmonary um, arterial hypertension, so it's a disease of the pulmonary vasculature. So you're going to have intermittent hyperplasia, medial hypertrophy, as you can see on the top slide here. And then um, the hemodynamic correlates as the disease, uh, disease progresses is the PA pressure increases, uh, um, and but the cardiac output stays about the same with uh, some RV adaptive hypertrophy. But as the disease progresses, the PA pressure, in fact, falls because there's a decrease in cardiac output. And that's what leads to sort of uh, the, the end stage disease of pulmonary hypertension, which is associated with severe RV dysfunction. So uh, in whom should you consider this disease? Again, in the, as a differential diagnosis of exertional dyspnea syncope, angina, and people who have, you know, uh, dyspnea on exertion or, or progressive limitation of exercise capacity. Um, and in the echo lab, this is, you know, how do you make a diagnosis? We went over it a little bit. Look at the TR jet. You really need to have an adequate TR jet uh, to make, uh, to calculate PASP, which is, uh, you know, you look at the velocity and square it and times uh, four. Um, and anything over 40, you should be uh, um, considering pulmonary hypertension in these patients. And um, again, this is an apical four chamber. So this is the normal echo, and as you can see here, this is somebody with advanced uh, pH where the LV is underfilled, the left atrium is really small, and look at the uh, right atrium and the right ventricle, which is enlarged, and the functions uh, decreased. And this is the parasternal short axis. Again, this is normal, and this is uh, advanced pulmonary hypertension showing a markedly decreased RV function um, with uh, really you know, small LV with both diastolic and systolic pressure overload, as you can see with septal flattening, both diastole and systole. Um, one of the things to uh, consider, you know, when you're in the echo lab or you're seeing patients, most of the pH you're going to see is due to left heart disease. So in terms of being able to differentiate them, 
if you are mostly you know, older, have systemic hypertension, coronary artery disease, AFib, and all the other risk factors for diastolic or systolic heart failure, those are the patients in whom you should you know, suspect PHD or to have PEF. Now, you know, the problem now is with PAH, there is almost a, a now another epidemic where you're seeing it much more later with a lot of older patients. In the last reveal registry, which was the registry of all the PAH patients, about 25% of them, even though they had PAH, had all these risk factors. So in the, in the 90s and in, you know, in the 80s, PAH was really considered to be a young woman's disease no longer because you're seeing a lot of elderly patients getting a lot of connective tissue disease because uh, you know it's really of bimodal um, distribution of crest and uh, systemic sclerosis so and and mctd so you're seeing a lot of uh, those patients um, get ph and a lot of these patients have pah with concomitant disease uh, concomitant HEFPEF, but not necessarily PH due to HEFPEF. So there is a clear distinction. It's often very hard to make the distinction just based on echo. So if you are suspecting that you know this pulmonary hypertension is out of proportion to the level of diastolic heart failure they have, these patients should undergo a right heart cath. Again, right heart cath is needed to define the disease and really prior to starting treatment in PH. Um, what are the other things you will need to do to make sure it's not due to, you know, who group three, which is due to lung disease, um, uh, is to get PFTs, CT of the chest. Also look at these uh, other um, uh, risk factors which can lead to who group one uh, PH, which is HIV, ANA, LFTs. Um, again, um, let's, uh, since I have five minutes, I'm just going to go to the uh, slides which really show the, 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 the disease-specific pathways um, uh, in which the drugs have been approved. So that's the endothelin pathway, it's nitric oxide pathway, and the prostacyclin pathway. So when you look at um, the endothelin pathway, the endothelin one actually acts on both smooth muscles and uh, endothelial cells to increase proliferation and vasoconstriction. And uh, the depletion of nitric oxide uh, leads to vasoconstriction, which is a hallmark of the disease. And the same, uh, same thing with prostaglandins, uh, which um, the deficiency leads to vasoconstriction and proliferation. So, you know, initially there was only one uh, drug, which was epoprostanol, for almost 10 years, and that was IV, and that was the only thing we had to treat this disease. But now there are 13 drugs which have been approved uh, to treat uh, pulmonary hypertension, and a lot of them are oral and a few inhaled, with uh, really uh, the gold standard still being epoprostanol, which is really reserved for patients with uh, you know, uh, class four symptoms. When you're looking at pulmonary hypertension, uh, we use WHO class, which is a little bit different from NYHA NYH class, because you do add syncope to it. If you've had syncope, then you, know, you qualify as class four, and presyncope qualifies as class three, uh, which you know is different from patients with um, uh, heart failure. Um, again, specific features of some pH therapies. You know, ERAs uh, they are effective in early form of pH. The ERAs to me are more like the beta blockers of heart failure, so I would avoid them when they are um, volume overloaded because one of the side effects of ERAs is actually volume retention. And uh, liver toxicity used to be a problem with bosentan, but with macitentan and ambrosentan, it's less of an issue. In fact, FDA has even taken away the, the, the recommendation to uh, check LFTs in, in these patients. Um, and uh, PD-5 inhibitors are, um, again, work on the nitric oxide pathway, and um, uh, again, can be used in um, early disease, but later in the disease because the nitric oxide production goes down and PD-5 inhibitors are NO dependent, they are less helpful. Uh, and that's where the SGC stimulators uh, come in, which are NO uh, independent. And uh, again, this has been approved for both PAH and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Um, prostonides are really the most effective and the gold standard therapies that we have. 
but unfortunately, you know, the, the side effect profile is so high that almost 30% don't tolerate the medication. Uh, and um, uh, hence, we end up, you know, either switching them to uh, orals or uh, other forms of uh, prostonites, which are less effective. Uh, but at least the current guidelines suggest that you should be using this for patients with class 4 symptoms. Um, uh, despite them being the most effective uh, therapies. So this was one of the pivotal trials which just came out two years ago, the Ambition trial, which again so, sort of followed the paradigm of heart failure where upfront dual therapy was tested against uh, upfront or sequential therapy where you start a medication and then depending on the progression of patient add another medication. And as you can see here, the event-free survival was much better with uh, dual upfront therapy versus uh, single therapy. But again, you know, I just wanted to pay attention here in terms of, you know, look at three-year uh, event-free survival is still very, very low. It's, you know, 67%. So it still continues to be a morbid disease uh, uh, and with high mortality, but it's much better than what it was before, where in the 90s, when they did the NIH study, you know, three-year survival was uh, as low as 35%. Now, quick thing about uh, risk stratification PAH. Um, so there are two uh, risk stratifying schema. One is the uh, ESC -ER, um, ERS guidelines, then the other one is the reveal risk score. Reveal risk score is something that we use more in, in, the, in North America compared to this. But all of these essentially look at uh, features of RV dysfunction. So if you have uh, you know, um, signs and symptoms of RV dysfunction, including pericardial effusion, you know, a horrible six-minute walk, um, uh, and syncope, then, y you know, you are at uh, risk of not doing well. And those are the patients in whom you should consider using prostacyclines early. Quickly changing gears, I guess I don't have time to talk about RV failure, but uh, I'll just quickly go over a few things. Um, this is actually, science, you know, the Intermax definition, which you know, RV failure used to be really something that we would really, uh, the patients who take care of congenital heart disease patients or uh, patients with pH would worry about. But now with LVADs, you know, it's become a lot more prominent because uh, that, that is really the, the Achilles heel in patients who are undergoing long-term LVAD support. So these are, these are the RV failure definition for, from Intermax, which is actually a registry for mechanical um, uh, circulatory support. Uh, but overall concept is the same. CVP is high, cardiac index is low. And depending on whether you need um, mechanical circulatory support or just inotrope, you can uh, differentiate them into mild, moderate, or severe. Um, and uh, some of the causes of acute RV failure, post LVAD, post bypass, post mitral valve surgery, acute PEs, RV infarction, and decompensated or end-stage pulmonary hypertension. Um, uh, I won't get into this, but uh, overall, um, uh, you know, in terms of how you treat it, um, again, afterload reduction, preload optimization, because the classic uh, teaching is, is it all comes from RV infarct, where you're considered to be preload dependent and the, the classic teaching is to load them with fluids, but I would caution people that yes, it's okay in patients with acute MI to load them, but again, to, you all are familiar with the, you know, Frank Starling's curve, so you don't want them to have a CVP of 20. You know, no RV will like a CVP of 20, so optimize the uh, RV preload to maybe a CVP of eight to 10 or eight to 12. But so you should be judicious in giving the fluids, but maybe in, in 500 cc's or a liter at the most. But then look at pre, you know uh, afterload optimization with inhaled nitric oxide or prostacyclines, and then with inotropes with dobutamine or uh, or melanone. And uh, I guess Imad's already here. So <laughs> uh, again, you know, protective ventilation, uh, uh, you know, a wide peep, and uh, and uh, and. Uh, address the underlying cause. If it's PE, then you're looking at thrombolytics. If it's acute RV infarct, primary PCI, and uh, inhaled nitric oxide like we talked about, and uh, we're not gonna talk about Impella, RP, or ECMO, but this is something to consider, especially in patients who have acute uh, RV failure, either due to 
you know, in, in the post-operative setting or due to uh, uh, post-MI, uh, this is something to consider. So I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, sorry, it's just too much to cover in, uh, you know, 15 minutes. But if you guys have questions, happy to answer later. Mm -hmm.